like to the altar is open please feel free to come down and come before the Lord at the altar hallelujah as we prepare our hearts and minds hallelujah to humbly go before our God this morning hallelujah father with humble hearts oh God we come before you this morning father Ooh, with the heart of thanksgiving oh God hallelujah we approach your throne this morning, God. Hallelujah. Knowing that you sit high and you look low, oh God. Lord, that you see all and you know all. Father, that you would so graciously wake us again this morning, God. Start us on our way, oh God. Hallelujah. You said you provide us with new mercies every morning, oh God. Hallelujah. So we come humble this morning, oh God, to give you thanks, oh God, to invite you in by our praise, oh God, and our honor, hallelujah, that we will lift up to you this morning, oh God. Lord, we lay everything at your feet, oh God, that there will be nothing that would so easily beset us, hallelujah, from focusing upon you this morning, from hearing from you this morning, oh God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for those that we see as we look around the sanctuary this morning. We thank you, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the new mercies. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. For you have been good to us, oh God. Father, we thank you because long time ago, Hallelujah. You passed, you died, oh God. You set a path, oh God, hallelujah, that will redeem us back unto you, oh God. Hallelujah. And this morning, Father, we come before you, oh God, with thanksgiving, oh God. 
with gratitude. Hallelujah. We are so thankful and so grateful. Hallelujah. That no matter what we endure through the week, oh God, you brought us through, Lord. Hallelujah. And we come to hear from you this morning. We come to worship you this morning. We come to lift you up, oh God. For you said if you be lifted up, that all men shall be drawn unto you, O oh God. So take our cares. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, that our worship be not hindered. Hallelujah. And we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praises, thine. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go and worship. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.
worship him because he is awesome. Hallelujah.
if I get a little emotional, but um, my dad is supposed to come up here to uh, give the announcements, but he asked me to uh, come up here to uh, tell you guys something. I didn't want to, um, but I told him no at first. Yeah, I got I to come up here and tell y'all this. Um, so today's Sunday, so Friday, Friday night at about 6.30. Um, I'm driving home, and I leave out of a, a fast food parking lot. I'm trying to make my, making the left in the traffic. Um, driver runs a red light and T-bones me on my driver's side. Um, after that, I don't really remember much. Blacked out for about seven seconds. Came to just in time to um, stop myself from crashing into a tree. Um, <laughs> tried to get out my driver's side. Um, driver's side door went open. Had to climb out my uh, passenger side. Um, went to the hospital. Um, I didn't think anything was wrong with me. Doctor said, I'm all good. Um, so. He said I would feel some pain afterwards. But I'm telling y'all this Sunday morning, I feel no pain.
so good You've been so good Help me say you've been You've been so good Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Don't stop right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's my son. Hallelujah. 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 When the phone call comes through, it's, it's hard, right? You don't know what to do. And I'm the man of the house, so I can't show too much emotion. I got to pack it together, right? I got to pull on out with the family and figure out what's going on. But when you get there and the EMT say, what kind of car is that was he driving? And I said, it's a Dodge. He said, well, they built that door good, I tell you that. What do you say? He's been so good. He's been so good. He's been so good to all of us, church. He's been so good. I bless the Lord today. I bless the Lord today. You find me up here, I always say it could have been another way. I thank God that he kept from hurt, harm, and danger. That's the closet prayers, church. That's the in the shower prayers, church. That's the people on the other side that you don't see praying, church. That's what that is. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. While I stand before you today, I'm Deacon Sean Cardoza, and I stand before you to welcome you. I welcome you to the Bible Way Ministries International, also known as The Way. Our vision, mission, and purpose is loving God, loving people, and making disciples. And we do that by loving people to Christ and discipling souls to maturity. We believe that the only thing worse than being lost is being lost, but having no one looking for you. Jesus himself said, I came to find, save, and restore the lost. Our ministry focus is each of us developing a growing list of friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, coworkers, enemies, strangers, also known as our Francis list, and those who have strayed utilizing a blessed strategy to connect and share our stories of what Christ has done in our lives. He's been so good. God has given each believer a spiritual gift to bless others, and our hope is that you will experience love, joy, peace, warmth, and a welcome today, either in person or virtually. As we worship today, you'll have the opportunity to come home, become a part of God's family and this local church. To all guests worshiping in person and through our streaming platforms, we'd appreciate you completing a guest card in the lobby. And those online, please inbox your contact information so that we may personally thank you for worshiping with us. Finally, please keep up with the events and activities by downloading Bible Way Ministries app. There is an app for that. We thank you for being here today and bless you in the name of Jesus. As we turn it over to Pastor and the appreciation this morning. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God some praise. Give God some glory. We have the privilege and the pleasure today. I'm going to ask the ministers to join me here up front as we invite and welcome the family of little Emily Elizabeth Jefferson. I'm going to ask them to stand and come here to the altar with me. As they come, I'm going to ask three of them to play this short video 
that her family posted about her first year of life. Give God praise. Well, I don't know when I've seen a child who is so beautiful and so loved. Come on, give God praise for Emily. I am grateful and thankful for this great host of friends and family. I just almost want to tell the church family, if you feel like you're part of this family, you ought to come down here too. <laughs> We just sort of feel like Megan is ours, and by extension, Emmanuel is ours, and these children, and now Emily. Come on and give God praise if you know that it is so. So she's just over a year old. She was born September 11, 2023. These are her beautiful, blessed parents, Emmanuel and Megan Jefferson. Come on and acknowledge them. Thankful for the call of God upon both of your lives and thankful for the way, Megan, that you serve this church family. Thankful for the members of your extended family who are here. I want to acknowledge Godparents, Nivek Anderson, Bradley McKee, grandparents, Sharon and Michael Lowe, grandparents, Kenneth and Denise Holmes. Kenny, it's good to see you back home. <laughs> Somebody give God praise for him. He's been taking care of his parents in Valdosta. Many of us are keeping in touch with him. Grandparents, Willie and Brenda Jefferson, amen. And um, he is not just Willie Jeff Jefferson. He is Elder Pastor Jefferson. Sir, for many years, congregations within the Church of God in Christ, sir, you honor us with your presence. Let's give God praise. Great-grandparents, Shirley Reed great-grandparents, Jesse and Dorothy Holmes, and then this great host. Come on and give God praise for them. I want to take you to the Word of God, the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1. I grew up, and this is the way I heard my father, who's standing next to me, Apostle Noah, would share it with the congregation. And Hannah, somebody say Hannah, made this vow, O oh Lord, if you, look, you will look down upon my sorrow, and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to you, to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound. He thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I'm not drunk, but I am very sad, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Please don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of my great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, cheer up. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramoth. When Elkanah slept with his wife, the Lord remembered her request. Somebody repeat after me. The Lord remembered her request. You know, that's language that simply means God answered her prayer. In due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. The next year, Elkanah, Penina, and her children went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, but Hannah did not go. She told her husband, wait until the baby is weaned, then I will take him to the tabernacle and leave him there with the Lord permanently. I always like to remind the family, you cannot leave your child here at the church. <laughs> Whatever you think is best, Elkanah agreed, stay here for now. 
May the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the baby. And when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a half bushel of flour and some wine. And after sacrificing the bull, they took the child to Eli. Sir, do you remember me, Hannah asked. I am the woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this child. And God has given me my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life, and they worship the Lord there. That is why we are here, to offer this child back to the Lord all the days of her life. Somebody ought to give God praise. Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And they brought young children to Jesus that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say unto you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arm and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. As we prepare to anoint this child with oil, I'm going to ask one of the ministers to get the oil ready. And as we prepare to have the child placed into the arms of Apostle Norwood to bless this child, I want to say to the congregation, to those of you who are gathered here today, to these parents, by your coming and your witnessing this sacred ceremony, Emily will not remember this, but you will. And my challenge to you, my request of you, is that you will remind her of this day that she was offered back to the Lord. And not only her, but by your being here, that you will offer yourselves back to the Lord. If that is your commitment, your promise, please answer, I do. Let's anoint this child with oil. Would you stretch your hands towards us as we offer prayers? Lord God, we thank you for the fruit of the womb. We thank you for Emmanuel. We thank you for Megan. We thank you for this great host of witnesses, the great unseen cloud of witnesses. This child did not come from them. This child came from you through them. So here we are today. In the example of Hannah offering her mind, body, soul, and spirit back to you all the days of her life. Even as your servant David declared, thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over. God, we pray your hedge around her. We pray your favor, your anointing, your blessing that all that you have called her to be, that she will fully manifest, that it will come to fruition. For we walk by faith and not by sight. And we thank you by faith that this is so. In the name of Jesus, so it is we pray. And all of the people of God said together, amen, amen. and amen. amen. As Apostle holds this child up, you might need to help a little bit, Emmanuel. We now present to you the newest princess in the family of God, little Emily Elizabeth Jefferson. Somebody give God glory. Somebody give God praise. Let's give God praise for this family as they return to their seats. Amen. And amen. And amen. This time we'll receive our video announcements. September 28th, Mental Health First Aid. The Evangelism Outreach is sponsoring a mental health training session where you will learn about mental health and substance use challenges. All leaders and those who serve on Sundays are asked to attend. It is open for everyone. Saturday, September 28th, 
from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Lunch will be served. See Elder Will Francis for more information and register on the BW app or call the church office. September 29th, Men's Atlanta Falcons Fellowship. Join the men of Bible Way Ministries International after service in the Fellowship Hall for a Falcons rivalry game against the New Orleans Saints. Food, fellowship, and football. See Deacon Tom Brown for more information. October is Pastoral Appreciation Month, so make sure you submit your love offerings. You asked for it again, and here it is. Barber Shop Talk 2 is October 13th at 12 noon. Stay tuned for more information about it. These have been our Bible Way Ministry announcements. We're excited about all the new things coming ahead, so please be sure to stay tuned. And in closing, may I remind you of our memory verse of the month. John 3, 16 through 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Enjoy the rest of the service. Hallelujah. How many of you know Jesus will do exceedingly and abundantly above anything you could ask or think? Jesus will give you a village to help you raise a baby. Thank God for my village. Ooh, open doors that I cannot see. Jesus will. Jesus will. Oh. Jesus, we. 
want to say it, give God praise, for I know, yeah. glory give God praise for he is worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same the name of our God is to be praised if you're blessed and you know that you're blessed come on and put your hands together one more time and give God a praise for he is worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same the name of our God is to be praised. As you look around, just greet two or three people with a smile and a friendly hand wave. Just thank God for all of those who are in the room today. And one more time, can we acknowledge our streaming audience, those who are streaming from across the metro. Come on, we can do better than that. Across the nation, from around the world. We welcome everyone to the house of the Lord and we want to acknowledge this extraordinary music ministry. Thank God for each of them. Can you make some noise for the raise of praise? Our children, come on and bless the Lord. Come on and give God glory. I want to ask all of the parents, grandparents, guardians, just wave your hands. We don't take for granted that you get them here for rehearsal. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, parents. Come on, come on and give God praise for them. This is my favorite choir. Amen. Weren't they good today? I loved it. I loved it. We give God praise for everybody from everywhere. I want to thank God for safe travels to Johannesburg, South Africa, Istanbul, Turkey, and for the privilege of being back safe and sound. Come on, you can do better than that. God is taking me literally around the world. Uh, a combined 40 hours of flying time. I flew through Istanbul, Turkey, and did a tour there. Many of you are familiar with Galatians in your Bible. I went to Galatia, the place where Paul wrote the letter, amen, and had a chance to fellowship with pastors, and we'll show you many of those pictures and clips that we had an opportunity. I want to shout out Apostle Norwood, who is our former global apostle to global missions. He supported this trip. I want to thank God for his encouragement. And uh, our new regional apostle, Apostle Reginald Davis, is calling me the Bishop of South Africa. I don't think they have made that official at all. So. <laughs> but we have taken in some churches in South Africa to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody give God praise for the ministry that is going forth. We'll need to talk to the new apostle to Global Missions, Apostle Parsons, about that. But we thank God for all of God's people. And then back here, back home, I want to thank God for those of you who came out yesterday. Somebody say yesterday. And supported the Evans family in the home going of Mother Ruth Evans. If you were here, you served in any way, would you wave your hand that we might acknowledge you? Come on and thank God for her life. Come on and give God praise for the life of Mother Ruth Evans. We thank God. Now reunited with her husband, one of our faithful deacons, Deacon Willie Evans. Come on, let's thank God for their memory, for the promise that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. But then i got to back up and thank God for what happens here on Sunday. I want to thank God for the intercessors who come in at 8 o'clock a.m. Come on, intercessors, wherever you are, would you wave your hand? We like to tell people that this sanctuary is not just air conditioned, but it's prayer conditioned. Amen. Come on, look at two or three people and tell them you have been prayed for. Come on, tell them you have been prayed for. Isn't that good? Isn't that a good feeling? And what a tremendous testimony, Josh and Father. Come on and thank God for the testimony of how God kept and preserved the life of our son. Amen. We thank God for him. And then I want to thank God for Sunday school. I get excited about Sunday school. Somebody give God praise if you were here. We're also excited about small groups. Where are my small group facilitators and participators? So you can get this information on all of our platforms or you can call the church office. It's not too late. Somebody say not too late. 
to connect with a small group. On Mondays at 8 p.m., Pastor Michael McCants. These are all via Zoom, by the way. You just Zoom in. Mother Evelyn Manning on the phone at 2 o'clock p.m. on Mondays. Amen. Minister Janine Outley on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Note the later time, 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, Minister Annette Noel on... Come on and give God praise. Also, Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. And then one of our newest group, the men have a group. Somebody make some noise for the men. Tuesdays at 8 p.m. with Brother Stephen Klinkscale. Come on and give God praise. I put out a challenge to any man who would step up to the plate. I'll volunteer to co-facilitate with you. Brother Stephen Klinkscale said, here am I, Lord, send me. We had five brothers on. We committed each one of us to bring another brother, so there ought to be ten brothers. It may be you. Somebody give God praise for the men. <laughs> Amen. Evangelist Mary McNeese on Fridays at 6.40 p.m. Minister Lula Thomas. Amen. On Thursdays at 8 o'clock p.m. And then on Sunday mornings at 9 p.m. with Sister Anna Noel. Can we thank God for all of our small groups? We ask you to give your attention to them. And then one final uh, reminder before the Word of God comes forth. This afternoon at 1 o'clock p.m., I realize many of you didn't know about it. We had the wrong date down, so we did not get a chance to announce it. But this afternoon, somebody say this afternoon. At 1 o'clock p.m., I will be the guest speaker for the 88th church anniversary of our neighboring church, the Silverleaf Baptist Church. Somebody give God praise for 88 years. This is a congregation that's right here in our community. Uh, it's located at 1923 Turner Road, almost walking distance from us. But I will be there as a special guest church anniversary speaker at 1 o'clock p.m. The pastor is... Pastor Bobby Giddens, and you may not know that name, but Pastor Bobby Giddens is a practicing attorney. He's also a pastor, and he's done legal work for this congregation for decades, and so it is my honor to go and represent you. He's also the part of the fellowship of pastors and ministers in this congregation as we seek to bring unity, information, and knowledge to the, congregate, to the community that will benefit the community. Let's thank God for the Silverleaf Baptist Church. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to direct your attention to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 2. There's so many people here from everywhere. Amen. Glad to see so many familiar faces. I saw uh, Deacon Sylvester Everhart, Sister Andrea here. We give God praise for them. I was texting with them not long ago. I said, guess what? We got a baby. <laughs> I, I wanted them to think that Lady One and I had a baby. <laughs> they said, yeah, we know you got a grandbaby. <laughs> Let's thank God that the ministers of music are being fruitful at Bible Way Ministries International. When you have Acts chapter 2, would you stand to your feet? Will you stand one final time? I'm reading this morning from the New International Version of the Holy Bible. Acts, the second chapter. I'm beginning at the 42nd verse. As you stand, if there's anybody around you without their scriptures, would you put a smile on your face and then invite them to join you as we read together now the word of God. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. We will, I'll read down through the end of the chapter. I'm reading again from the New International Version of the Holy Bible. It may read differently from yours, but it is the same word of God. And we find these words. They devoted. Somebody say devoted. They devoted themselves, somebody say they devoted themselves, to the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, somebody say every day. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord, somebody say the Lord. And the Lord added, somebody say added, to their number daily, not weekly. Somebody say daily. 
those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. It is already blessed. Lord, we need to hear from heaven today. We thank you now for everything that has gone before, the singing, the shouting, the testimonies, the praises. But Lord, we know that our coming would be incomplete without the proclamation of your word. So speak now, Lord, for your servants here, and we will give you the praise. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray, and every heart said, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk this morning from the subject, Marks of an Authentic Church. Marks of an Authentic Church. The marks, the characteristics of an authentic church. And if you think about that title, there must be an inauthentic church. But I don't know about you. I want to be a part of a church that keeps it 100. I'd like to be a part of a church that keeps it real. A church based on the scriptures, trying to be biblical, to do what the first church, the early church, birthed in the book of Acts did. And so we've been focusing on that. We've been focusing on what the early church was like, what God intends for us. And this morning, as we look at the marks of an authentic church, I would subtitle this message, Keeping It 100. How do, how do we do that? And I want to begin by talking about something that pertains to you individually, something that pertains to this congregation, something that pertains to the wider body of Christ, the kingdom of God. And that is, if you're taking notes, this is not in the growth notes that you may see on our app, but you'll need to write this one down. I want to begin talking about something called mission drift. Somebody say that, mission drift. As a matter of fact, there's a book by the same title, Mission Drift, the unspoken crisis facing leaders, charities, and churches. When I say mission drift, I don't know what comes to your mind. Perhaps if you've got a military background, it begins to come into focus that you were given a mission, and if you forget what the mission is, and you end up doing something altogether different, you have experienced mission drift. Without careful attention, faith-based organizations drift from their founding missions. It's just that simple, and it can easily happen. And so the question I want to raise in talking about Mission Drift is, why do so many organizations wander from their mission while others remain true to their mission? What's the difference? I want to ask another question. Can the drift be prevented? In their book, Mission Drift, The Unspoken Crisis Facing Leaders, Charities, and Churches, the writers show how to determine whether your organization is in danger of drift, and they share the results of their research into mission, true mission, and untrue mission in organizations. Even if your organization is on course, it is wise to look for ways to prevent mission drift. In other words, this is a temptation that comes to all of us. You may have a purpose in life, and if you look back over your life, you have drifted from the purpose that you stated for yourself. Am I talking to anybody in the room besides myself? I want to suggest that we cannot afford not to periodically both personally, somebody said that's me. We cannot afford periodically both personally and congregation not to look at our own vision, mission, and purpose. For us at Bible Way, what is it, church? It is loving God, loving people, making disciples. It's basically what Jesus said when they asked him, to sum up the whole Bible. They said, Jesus, we don't want to read all of that. We don't want to hear all of that. Just sum up the whole Bible. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Anybody here love yourself? May I see your hands? I love myself. I want to ask you, do you love your neighbor like you love yourself? But I think it might get complicated. Because some of us will go, you know, well, uh, I, you know, what had happened was, and you know, I don't really have any, I don't know my neighbors. And Jesus, so that we would mistake who our neighbors is, told the whole story. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then if you boil it down, he said, your neighbor is whoever is in need. It's not necessarily who lives beside you or near you. Your neighbor, somebody help me preach this, is whoever is in need. And so sometimes we need to look not only at the vision and mission and purpose of the church, but what about us personally? The questions we ought to ask ourselves is, have we left and have we lost our first love? I grew up in one of the most powerful series of messages that I recall Apostle Norwood preaching, and he would preach them from time to time, was on the seven churches of Asia Minor 
found in the book of Revelation. And one of those churches was the church at Ephesus. And you find the story in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. And he used to make the point that they had lost their first love. They left it and they lost it. And I think about that song, The Love I Lost. Mm. Somebody knows that song. Somebody doesn't. But the church had lost its first love. And the question we ought to ask ourselves is, have we drifted for those who love the Lord from that passion, that love that we once had for the Lord to the point we couldn't wait to get to the house of the Lord. We couldn't wait to testify. We couldn't wait to sing our song. That's just how good God had been to us. Do I have a witness in the house? When did we stop believing that God can save from the guttermost to the uttermost? When did we stop believing that God can pick you up and turn you around and place your feet on solid ground? When did we stop believing that he can save the lost, deliver the bound? When did we stop? When did we stop believing? When did we stop believing that baptism was necessary, that baptism and the Holy Ghost was for him? When did we stop? This book, Mission Drift, the unspoken crisis facing leaders, charities, and churches, gives a clear message inspiring and challenging us to intentionally keep Christ at the center of all of our efforts. If you don't get anything else, the message for you to take home with you is keep Jesus in the center. I don't care where you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you have. I don't care what you don't have. Keep Jesus first. That's what Jesus himself said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. But not only that, in the hip-hop community, anybody know anything about hip-hop? There's a, there's a singer, a rapper by the name of Drake who talks about standing on business. <laughs> and I love the phrase because it means sometimes you got to take care of business. And sometimes we are doing so much that we forget what our primary business is. Some of you look at me like you don't understand. Let me give it to you like this. If there was a Walmart that was open and they weren't selling anything, how long do you think it would stay open? Preach, pastor. Matter of fact, there are Walmarts that are open that are underperforming, and sooner or later they do what? You got it, you got it. And for some of us, <laughs> if you would ask what our purpose is, if the church were to be honest and ask what our purpose, some of us need to be shut down and help, help me preach, Lord. I'm getting a better picture now, Pat. I'm getting a better. Mission drift is a pressing reality for many organizations and individuals. Come on, look at two or three people say it's pressing for you, for me, for us. Mission drift can be defined as a move away from the goals established in the organization's purpose statement. If we are to love God, love people, and make disciples, my question is, can I put Bible way on blast? Can I put your pastor on blast? How many folk are getting saved? How many folk are getting discipled? My God, I'm going to leave it hanging there. I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. Mission drift is a widespread phenomenon that can occur in any organization. Examples of mission drift would be a church that allows, come on, watch this. Some, somebody's going to take it the wrong way. An example, and I didn't make this example up. An example of mission drift is a church that allows its food pantry to become its primary focus. It didn't say you don't need a food pantry. But you got to be careful what your primary focus is, preach pastor, or a parachurch ministry that becomes so focused on politics that it no longer shares the gospel. Come on in here, focus on the family. Or a Bible translation ministry that adds child sponsorship and drilling wells to its portfolio of outreaches so to the detriment of translating the Bible. In other words, you start to do other stuff, and pretty soon the main thing is no longer the main thing. I think you're preaching, pastor. I think you're coming through loud and clear. Now, if mission drift is left unchecked, it often leads to complete mission abandonment. Help me preach God. Help me preach God. An example of this end result of mission drift is what happened with the YMCA. Some of you know it and some of you don't. YMCA stands for Young Men's Christian Association. It left its Christian moorings a long time ago. Some of you that got something to do with Christ. No, 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 not anymore. Most centers are no longer concerned with Bible-based spiritual development. Rather, the why focuses on healthy living, social responsibility, and humanitarianism. Watch this. Another famous example of mission abandonment due to long-term mission drift is Harvard University. An early Harvard publication stated, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That was the purpose statement of Harvard University. 
I don't think Harvard University would know God if he came and kicked them in the pants. Most of the Ivy League schools started out as Bible schools, seminaries that trained men, and it was not women at the time, men for ministry. My point is, if you're not careful, you will drift from what your purpose is. My God, here is the most challenging part. Pastor, leave me alone. If I'm hyperventilating. <laughs> Mission drift seems to be the natural tendency in all organizations, including churches. We've been around, around 75 years. We were birthed in a prayer meeting, a house-to-house -house prayer meeting by three precious women of God, my father's mother, my paternal grandmother, Darthula Miles Norwood, uh, my great-aunt, Mother Fanny Norwood, one of the precious mothers of the community, Mother Gladys Smith. I still remember Mother Gladys Smith. She used to scare me. I'm just going to put that out there. Baby. <laughs> Mainly, she used to catch me doing bad things as a child. <laughs> But God birthed this ministry, this church, literally in a house-to-house -house prayer meeting. And I always think how ironic it is because the church itself was birthed in the prayer meeting in the upper room. Did you not know that's when the Holy Spirit came and the church was birthed? But the question is, do we remember our first love, our primary purpose? Mission drift in a Christian ministry can be caused by failing to prioritize the original mission statement, seeking to follow shifting societal values, head, heeding the desires of high dollar donors, or choosing to tone down an unpopular gospel. That pastor, they don't want to hear that anymore. In the book, Mission Drift, The Unspoken Crisis Facing Leaders, Charities, and Churches, it says that the natural course, the unfortunate natural evolution of many originally Christ-centered missions is to drift. In case you haven't got the point yet, if we don't do anything not to drift, we will drift. And if we're honest with ourselves and we look at our primary focus and our bottom line and the results, we have drifted. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me to be convicted of this in my heart, to throw myself on the altar. Churches are always in danger of experiencing mission drift. Some common symptoms of this are focus more on taking than giving. We ought to be giving more than we're taking, my God. Number two, a lack of Christ-centered community. I'll come back to that in the text we read earlier from Acts chapter 2. A self-consumed vision that disconnects from mission fields and church crises and conflicts that overshadow the gospel message. Nobody wants to come to a church where they fight all the time, where they disagree. It's not appetizing. It's not inviting. So what are some steps that we can take? I'm going to give you more, but I want to start with this clearly defined. Somebody say, you got to get it straight. Clearly define what the church's mission is. Determine what it is that the church's core identity and what matters most. And write it down and everybody know it. You just said it's to love God and love people. But how, many, how have you been loving God? How have you been loving people? And what kind of disciples are you making? Mm. You know, sometimes we miss it. We, no, this is another thing we can do. Stay humble. Realize that anyone can fall prey to mission drift. And realize that. When we recognize where we are, it's time to address it. Here's another one. We can abide in Christ. And here's a fourth one. After we abide in Christ, we can create and maintain a focus that will last. My God, my God, my God. That, that's what happened in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. What we see the birth of the church, and we see the development of the church early on, and we see something good. We see something that we recognize. We see something perhaps that we've read about, that we've heard. But sometimes what we see in the book of Acts chapter 2 and what we see today, see today may be two different things. Can I get a witness in the house? It may be different because we don't recognize God's purpose for us. It's the same purpose that God had for the church in the book of Acts chapter 2. I read it earlier. I'm going to come back and take it apart verse by verse. But this is the challenge. Somebody say the challenge that confronts each of us as we consider our own lives. I don't want to make this somewhere out there. You might say, I don't even know about the church. I'm not even connected to the church. Make this personal for yourself. Some of us are not effective as persons. Our lives are not meaning what God meant for them to mean because we have drifted from the purpose for which God created us. Mm. It is for that reason that the enemy of your soul has made certain that you are distracted. Somebody ought to write it down. Distracted, diminished, delayed, and detoured. 
because you missed the fact that you are the one for whom Abraham believed, for whom Isaac worked and Jacob wrestled. You're the one for whom David danced and Solomon ruled and Daniel prayed. You're the one for whom John was baptized, for whom Jesus died. You're the one for whom God sent these people as forerunners, as models and examples of what God has called us to be and to do. And since your potential is more than you have imagined, I want to challenge you today. Look at somebody and say, he's talking about you. I want to challenge you today in the power of the Holy Ghost to remember your first love, to remember your primary mission. You may not have what you want. You may not be where you want to be. You may not have done what you wanted to do. But your life, even though it is not perfect, can still be excellent if you make up in your mind that you're going to remember your first love. You're going to come back to the purpose for which God has created you so that you can be the person, we can be the congregation, we can be the church, the body of Christ that God called us to be. Because today is the day, somebody say today, that we can marshal our gifts, that we can summon our talents, that we can use our abilities for high ideals and to fulfill our purposes. Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays said this. He said that there, you should live your life so well that no one dead or living or yet to be born can do it any better than you. And what that means for us is we've got to recognize what our purpose is. If you don't know it, you've got to discover it, you've got to develop it, and then you've got to deploy it. It may not be easy, but it's possible. Somebody say it's possible. Now, can I give you a, a caution? It's not a microwavable process because microwave success only produces half-baked temporary reality. Help me preach, Lord. Mm. We must be willing to forsake our need for a shortcut because we know that in every shortcut we will be cut short. Preach, Pastor. It may not be easy to dampen our desire for our own destruction, control our temper, nurture our mind, pay our bills, support our children, marry the one that you've been living with, participate in cooperative economics, engage the political process, go to work every day, and humble ourselves to pray because it's easier to be Judas, to compromise, and to sell out than to be like Jesus and sacrifice. And yet I step up to this pulpit today to remind you that God is more than able to help you because we serve a God who is still able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to God's power that works in us. God is able to keep you if you want to be kept. God can make your dream come true no matter how long your dream has been deferred. If you will remember your first love and your first mission. If you take care of God's business, he will take care of yours. If I've got to witness somebody ought to give God some praise. This is true whether we're talking about our family, our nation, our church, whether we're talking about ourselves. We are to walk the talk and model what we mean, what we say, and what we do. We are to remember our first love and our first mission. We are to stand on business and become the person, the congregation, and the church that God has called us to be. Are we that, Pastor? We got a ways to go. We got a ways to go. My God, somebody look at somebody tell them, we got a ways to go. More than 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and he turned life as they knew it upside down. His teaching so riveted audiences that they went without food to hear him tell about a God who loved them unconditionally. They thronged to hear Jesus teach about the kingdom of God. What Jesus verbalized was so vital and valuable that he encouraged children to be a part of it. I just showed it to you. I read the passages from the Bible of when the children came and he blessed them. The poor sought it. The rich will be willing to hear it because there is some good news to be shared. And for three years, Jesus stood on business. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom and then to the shock, dismay, and utter belief of every hopeful follower, he was arrested and arraigned without a trial, tried on trumped up charges, mocked by soldiers, beaten by a mob, and then crucified on an old rugged cross. Some of you know the story. His disciples huddled in fear and depression because they had envisioned Jesus delivering Israel from Roman oppression, establishing a political kingdom on earth. But now his publicly executed assassination has taken place and all hope seemed lost. 
They thought that the king, along with the kingdom, the vision was dead. But three days later, somebody give God some praise. That's not how the story ends. Three days, he got up. He stood on business and he preached of the kingdom whose advance cannot be halted with a filibuster or sidetracked by partisan bickering of a kingdom that required no vote and feared no veto. 50 days, somebody say 50 days. After his resurrection, the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples during the Feast of Pentecost in response to what he had promised. It was as powerful and as compelling as it was dynamic. Somebody ought to thank God for the power of Pentecost. The church was birthed, and in this first church, prayers were answered. Miracle signs and wonders were manifest. The church was so irresistible, so viral, and so contagious that the scripture reports that the Lord added to their number daily. Not weekly, but daily. When the last time you heard people getting saved during the week? People getting delivered during the week. They didn't have to wait until Sunday. They didn't have to wait until church got together. They recognized they were the church wherever they were. Here's the first mark I want to suggest to you of an authentic church. It was that they had an authentic community, an authentic community. I don't know if you've noticed this phenomenon. Maybe you've not connected the dots. But when you look at the phenomenon of social media, do you not know that's a cry for social community? That's a cry for community. And oftentimes, it allows you to have community at your leisure because you can get as close as you want or as far as you want. You ever notice that people on five, six different platforms is because they are seeking community, but not just any kind of community, authentic community. I was talking to people about church growth, and I was trying to explain why I believe that some churches grow and some don't. And I used this word that I want to mention to you today, and some people got it, some people didn't. The word was simply affinity. People grow and people come, and churches grow and churches continue to grow where people have something in common with people. When we are real enough to be real, to take off the mask, to admit who we are, that we struggle, then people don't mind coming to a place where they struggle, other people struggle. Because we recognize that you don't have to be perfect to join this church. No, 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 you don't have to be perfect. As a matter of fact, if you are perfect, then you can't join because you'll mess us up because we'll mess you up. Mm -hmm. Somebody say authentic community. In the Jerusalem church, people were real. They were authentic, acknowledging their humanity, owning their imperfections, admitting their mistakes, taking off their mask, and relating to each other in a real way. In other words, don't give me a fake church. Give me a real church with real people, with real problems, with a real God, a real Savior, real truth, and real solutions to the stuff that I'm dealing with before I get to church and after I leave church. Somebody got to keep it 100. Authentic community is such a powerful thing that God designed us to be in relationship with one another. It don't mean you got to be married, but you need somebody. And before you get up out of here, you're going to need six people to carry you up out of here. Everybody needs somebody. I could take a survey and ask how many of you wish that for just once in your life, you could be in a group where you were known, loved, served, and celebrated just for being who you are. Everybody wants that. Everybody needs that. And here we call that small groups. <laughs> you didn't even see it coming. We, we worship in roles, but we grow in groups. This is where we do life, we share life. I love telling people about my imperfect. Pastor, you deal with that? Show up? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I will, not, I will not tell you all publicly on a Sunday morning that I have missed days in prayer. I will not tell you that. I, I'm not going to share that. There are days where I have missed reading the word. I'm not going to share that with you. I'm not going to come clean like that. But there's some stuff in my life. <laughs> Are y'all laughing too hard? There's some stuff in your life. Where are my mirror saints at? That's what drives social media empires of Instagram, Facebook, and threads on TikTok, and so many more, because people at their heart need community. My God, my God. I, I could take a survey and ask, and some of you would have to be honest, Pastor, I long for that, to be in a place where I can be myself and not be judged. That's why people go the other direction when you say, Ch church, why in the world would I ever go there? Because we can be some of the most mean, judgmental folks. Oh, my God. And that's just the preachers. I'm sorry. <laughs> Devotion 
Devotion is a powerful thing. It, 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 it's what helps us in the midst of life's disruptions, and we learn devotion in authentic community. Martin Luther King Jr. devoted his life to elevating the status of the poor, the disenfranchised, and as a result, laws were changed and doors were open. It's interesting, every time I see a documentary, and I actually teach on the life of Martin King, can you understand this? I want you to hear me say this. When Martin King lived, most people in the church were not with him or for him. I need to say it again. You, you need to go research the record. As much as we love him, we sing Kumbaya, we shall overcome, and we love the King holiday, and King this, and when he was living, he was vilified by the church in general and the black church in particular. There were few and far between those who stuck with him and marched with him. But now, because of the benefits of how God used his life, we all celebrate and give God glory. You put a church full of people together and you coach them to full devotion and you will have an entity so energetic that it can change any community, any nation, and even the world. That's what God did with his life. For the church, energized by the Holy Spirit and motivated by relational commitment to one another, has the power to change lives like nothing else. What are you saying, Pastor? When you know my life and I know your life, I'm able to support you. You're able to support me. We support one another. We have an authentic community. Somebody ought to give God praise for the church as a place for authentic community. This is not a museum for saints. This is a hospital for sinners. It's a place where people can be loved and accepted and affirmed in ways for previously they could only hope that the church could do. But now, somebody said now, God has called us to be an authentic community. Here's the next thing. God has called this to be a place of enthusiastic worship. Somebody say enthusiastic worship. I cannot wait to show you some of the videos from South Africa. They praise and they worship on a different level there. We sing one song and we're polite, that's nice. We sing two songs and we start to get the, the nod, it's, that's enough. We sing three songs, people sitting down in protest. I mean, they're going for an hour strong. An hour strong in praise and worship and moving and dancing and jumping up and down. You would get tired just looking at them. I've got the video proof. I can't wait to show it to you. Pastor, do they always do that? Yeah. Because they understand that this ought to be a place of enthusiastic worship. I don't come to get a praise. I come with my praise. And when I bring my praise and you bring your praise, God gets all of the praise. Somebody ought to give God praise. Give God glory. For he is worthy. Acts 2.47 says they were praising God and worship God for who God is and for what God had done. But not only that, they understood that sometimes life is not what we want it to be. I think of that song, I've had some good days and I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days outweigh my bad days. I don't know about you. But I didn't come to church to complain. I won't complain because God has been good to me. If I got a witness, somebody give him praise. Somebody give him glory. He's worthy. This ought to be a place of authentic community, enthusiastic worship, but also spiritual growth. Somebody say spiritual growth. Acts chapter 2 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, the teaching, because they understood that it took both the burning and the learning, the learning and the burning to live as God had directed them. In other words, they shouted and they studied. Preach, Pastor. And the truth is, shouting people need to study more. Where are my shouters? Uh-huh. Don't get quiet now. And studying people need to shout more. Because if you're going to survive in this life, you're going to need both inspiration and intelligence. So... Every time one of their gifted teachers taught, they were dialed in and tuned into everything and distracted by nothing. Because in this first church, they knew that spiritual growth was critical. You ought to give God some praise. They knew the importance of the word of God. They knew to hide the word in their hearts that they might not sin against the Lord. They understood that the church was a place of authentic community. Yes, it was a place of enthusiastic praise and worship, a place where they could learn but it was also a place of positive priorities because they invested their time, their talk, their talent, and their treasures. The Word of God says they had all things in common so that if one person had a need, they sold something and they met that need. There was no need that went unmet. 
Can I share something with you that will blow your mind? If we were to have you list every need in the room, more than half of those needs could be met right here, right today by those who are here if our hearts were in the right place. And we understood that God has blessed us to be a blessing to somebody else. Don't miss your shout. Don't miss your praise. We're called to be those kind of generous stewards. And this was the example that God gave us in the early church. Here's my last point. When the church remembers our first love and first mission, we will invite others and we will bring others. You know, statistics tell us that 80% in the United States of people who don't go to church said they would come if somebody simply invited them. And I like to put it like this, where people get invited, people get excited. Can I get a witness? The church is where people are born again, where people are baptized, where people get adopted into the family of God, where people learn and they grow. This first church lived in the reality that they were entrusted with the message of the gospel and had privilege of telling people that God loved them, that Jesus died for them, that they could have a relationship with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.19 put it like this, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Come on, look at two or three people and tell them, neighbor, you got some good news to share. Yes, you do, but the problem with some of us is it's time to get out of the comfort zone. I'm done. I'm done, but I want to leave you with this challenge that no growth happens in the comfort zone. So it's time for us to get out of the comfort zone and go to places that we would not normally be inclined to go. Talk to some people that we would usually walk right on by. Invite them and bring them if necessary. Share with them the love of God. Go to some chat spaces, chat rooms, homeless shelters, halfway houses, nursing homes, hospitals, runaway shelters, prisons, juvenile facilities, drug rehab centers, street corners, laundromats, shopping centers. Log in online. Go into the all the world. Talk to somebody about the goodness of God and don't take no for an answer because there's still room at the cross. Still good, there's still space in God's love. There's still seats in the kingdom of God for the young, the old, the rich, the poor, the informed, the illiterate, but we've got to invite them and bring them and welcome them. You got to tell the drug dealer, tell the felon, the returning citizen, the molested teenager, the abused spouse, the stripper, the gambler, the divorce, the unwed parent, the addict, the abandoned, the backslider, the broken, the unemployed, and the uninvolved. Tell the physician, the principal, the professor, and the programmer. Invite them, bring them, and welcome them because there's room at the cross. You believe that? There's room at the cross. That's what the hymn writer said. There's room, though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room, at, if you believe there's room at the cross, you ought to stand on your feet. Lord, I believe. If you did it for me, you can do it for others. Lord, I believe. If there's a testimony in the house, you ought to stand up and say, Lord, I'm going to tell it. Everywhere I go, you calmed my fears. You dried my tears. You extended my years. i got to tell somebody. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody. But I could not keep it to myself. I don't know who you are or where you are this morning, but as we stand with our heads bowed and as I prepare to extend the invitation to those today who are here under the sound of my voice, I don't know how the Spirit of the Lord has been talking to you, working on you, whether you are already fervently, intimately involved. But as the mission team joins me here at the altar, I want to extend the invitation to anybody today under the sound of my voice and anybody streaming who does not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. That's the first call. Pastor, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. I don't know him. The second call is to those who may be here. and You say, well, I've been in church. I've been around church, but I'm not sure. I want to invite you to come. The third call is to the backslider, those who have drifted away, fallen away. This is your day, your time, your hour to reconnect. Somebody say reconnect. The fourth call is to those who are not attached. You're not a member of the body of Christ called church. In the New Testament, there was no such thing as a believer who did not belong. Mm. You need a place to call home, whether you're streaming or whether you're in person. I'm going to ask the praise team to come. And as they prepare to lead us in that song, 
Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, the millions. Yes, they have come. Yes, yes, yes. There is room just for one mm -hmm. at the cross. Yes. There is room. Now with every head just for you. I want to offer one prayer for those who are here. Under the sound of my voice, Pastor, I know the Lord, and I give God praise for my own salvation, my own relationship. But if there's someone in your life, in your circle, that does not know Jesus Christ, would you come quickly to the altar that I might pray with you on their behalf? I want to stand in agreement with you that God will reach them. God will touch them. Would you come quickly from the right, from the left, from the center aisle? Would you come quickly to this altar? I want to pray with us as a group. We have friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, coworkers. We even got some enemies, some strangers, people we barely know, but we know they don't know the Savior. We're coming to stand on the Word of God, to be in agreement in prayer. Yes, the promise of salvation is given to us, is unto our children. It's unto those that are far off and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. If that you come quickly that we might pray together. Lord, I thank you for those who are moving right now. I thank you for those who've come by faith to this altar. I thank you, Lord, that you know what we need even before we ask, but you bid us come and ask. And so, Lord, here we are. First of all, offering ourselves, asking a blessing for ourselves. Lord, where we are honest enough to confess, we've drifted, Lord. We've experienced mission drift as individuals, as a congregation. Lord, here we are saying, Lord, help me. Help us. Open our eyes. Refocus us. Recenter us. And Lord, even as you do it for us, for those persons for which we came, those names, God, as we lift our hands, we call them by name right now. Family members, Lord, in love. Friends, oh God, that we're sowing seeds, Lord. We're praying fervently for them. We stand in agreement, God, that you will convict, you will draw. You said, if I be lifted from the earth, you said, I'll draw. And Lord, we thank you even now for salvation by grace through faith. We thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost to convict, to draw, Lord. We thank you for what you did in us, and we thank you that it is no secret what you can do. What you've done for others, you can do for us. We offer this prayer now in thanksgiving in that name that is above every name, for it is in the name of Jesus that we pray, and every heart said, amen. Come on and give him praise. Come on and give him glory. Yes, they have come. But there's still room. Just for one. Just for one. At the cross. There is room. Yes. Just for you. Come on, one more time. Let's sing it with the choir. Yes. No million. No million. Yes, they have come. Yeah, yeah. There is room just for one at the cross. There is room just for you. Come on and thank God for the word. Hallelujah. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. We're going to prepare now. Cross. At the cross 
Come on and give God praise in the house. Hallelujah. At this time, we're going to prepare to worship the Lord with our gifts. Praise the Lord is offering time. Praise the Lord is offering time. And the ushers are in the aisles to serve those of you who wish an envelope for those who are returning the Lord's tithe, giving our offerings, sowing our seeds of faith. We want to thank God for the faithfulness and the generosity of the people of God for those of you who give throughout the week through all of the social media platforms. You will see ways to give on the screen right now. We want to, again, thank you for your support. Thank you for your generosity. I grew up hearing these words every Sunday. Some of you will remember these words when you hear me start to read them. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But this I say, <laughs> he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully would you bow your heads in prayer with me as we bless the givers bless the tithe as those who are returning the first portion of all that god has blessed you with back to the lord understanding that when we put god first god is able to make all things all grace abound to us if i've got a witness somebody ought to give god praise for the things that the lord has done for you that money and material possessions could never do because he is the God of all grace. Lord, as we lift our hands in your presence, bless now we pray the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, would you stand now and come under the direction of the ushers from the rear of the sanctuary first? Let us give to the Lord. Here you go. 
Didn't they do an awesome job? Come on, let's, we can do better than that. As we prepare for the benediction, let's clap it up a little bit more for the youth for today. So today's a special day. Everybody says, what is he talking about? We woke up this morning for one. But the other is, on the 27th, 22nd of September, 2007, I married somebody, y'all. Where's she at? Stand up for me, baby. It's our 17th year anniversary. Happy anniversary to you, my darling. In Jesus' name. Can you stand for the benediction? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Go in peace, by the way. Wasn't that a powerful message? Hebrews 4, 16 reminds us that we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence, where we can find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. My name is Elder Tanetta Collins, and I am a member of the pastoral team here at Bible Way Ministries. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation, felt touched by today's message, and would like prayer, or have a special need, we have a team of people ready and willing to pray with you. If you are viewing the live stream on the website or Bible app, you can click live prayer on the bottom right of your screen or click the prayer request link at the header of the website. If you are viewing us from one of our social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or catching the replay, please visit our website, bwmi.faith. Again, that's bwmi.faith. And click the word prayer in the header to join us in one of our scheduled prayer times or complete the prayer request form for a member of our trained staff to intercede with and for you. Lastly, we want to connect with you. Salvation, membership, or simply rededication, we are available to you. On our website, under the About header, you can find more information under Next Steps, again, the About header, Next Steps, where we invite you to join in with us. Become a member of the Bible Way family. There is a place for you here at Bible Way. I'm excited with what God is doing in your life. In some cases, it may not seem like much right now, but God is at work in you, through you, and all around you. Be encouraged, and we look to see you again next week. Stay tuned. There is no way like the Bible way. I can't compromise now. I got too much ahead of me. God, you got too much, and the best for me is yet to come. Everybody needs to hear the good news.